Hi, everyone. We are so glad that you're here this afternoon to learn about planned giving and how it can fit into a dynamic financial plan. My name is Beth Francesco. I'm the Senior Director of the National Press Club Journalism Institute. Welcome, and thank you for making the time to be here today. We're going to be recording this session, and we'll post the video to our site for your reference later today. So if you miss something, don't worry. You'll have a chance to catch it a second time. We hope you're going to have lots of questions. You can share them anytime in the Q&A queue, which you can find to the bottom right in your Zoom screen. So take a second and locate it now. You can go ahead and click it open. That way, if you have any questions, you can just pop them in that Q&A. Um, we're going to be monitoring questions and answering as many as we can get to this afternoon. We do have an intentionally smaller group today so that we can be as thorough as possible with your questions. Uh, the Institute is really grateful to our panel of experts in financial planning, joining us from West Financial Services. I'm very happy to introduce Kristen Anderson, the firm's head of retirement plans, services, and financial planning departments. Her primary responsibility is the development and delivery of consulting services for fiduciaries of 401k and related retirement plans. In addition, she's in charge of coordinating comprehensive planning services for new and existing clients. Kristen's been with West since 1995. I'm also pleased to introduce Rick Gibson, who joined the financial planning department in 2019 uh, as a senior financial planner. Rick has over six years of experience in financial services, and his primary responsibilities are to prepare financial plans, manage planning processes, and man, uh, maintaining client relationships. He, like our other instructors, is a certified financial planner professional. And uh, the woman who will kick off our learning this afternoon Cheryl Langston, who joined West Financial in 2019 as a relationship manager. She brings more than 20 years of experience in comprehensive financial planning, trust and estate planning, insurance and investment strategies. Cheryl helps clients navigate through complex financial matters and realizes the importance of giving back to the community. She enjoys helping clients establish charitable legacies, formulate gifting strategies to maximize contributions and tax benefits, while ensuring that families achieve their own financial goals and needs. Thank you each for so, so much for being here with us today. Cheryl, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Beth. We appreciate the Journalism Institute and the partnership Kristen and Julie um, and others at the Institute have cultivated over the last few years. It is great to see all of the good work the Institute has accomplished as a 50C3. One of the most rewarding aspects of our job here at West is helping nonprofit organizations make a positive impact on society and inspire others to do good in a world of need. For those of you who may not be familiar with us, West Financial will soon celebrate our 40th year serving the DMV with asset management, retirement, financial planning services. While we are located in McLean, Virginia, we serve clients across 33 states. As a fee-only registered investment advisor, West Financial is committed to our role as a fiduciary for our clients, always putting their interest and financial well-being first. We are passionate about improving the lives of those we serve, providing exceptional financial services and customized solutions that earn trust and build lifetime relationships. We do this through financial education, detailed attention, and honest communication sharing many of the same ethical standards and principles in the journalism industry. My introduction to the world of journalism began 26 years ago today when I married a newspaper reporter. And while my husband may tell you I married him for his good looks and charm, I was actually more attracted to the way he lived out the values that reporters must uphold. Honesty, integrity, commitment to the truth and to transparency. Never have these values been more important but ironically, never have they been more challenged or challenging. In a world where information can be misconstrued, misunderstood, and even misguided, it is wonderful to see the support, education, and connections the Journalism Institute provides for journalists. I don't have to tell you how hard the past one and a half years have been for everyone. You know those stories all too well, and in fact, many of you probably have written them. For those of us in the financial services industry, we see two interesting reactions to the pandemic. One is that clients want to make sure their financial affairs and estate plans are in order. We've all seen the harsh reality that no one is guaranteed a tomorrow. And the other impact is a little more positive. Clients want to make a difference in the lives of others. They want to give back. 
establish a legacy and make a positive lasting impact on matters they're passionate about. We hope this presentation will be informative and thought provoking as you consider your own personal financial and estate matters, how you might establish your own legacy and what that may mean for you and your loved ones. So our agenda today, um, Rick will begin by covering exactly what plan giving is. And next he will discuss the challenge of balancing family and charitable goals. Uh, Rick will then give a few ideas on where you may want to start. Kristen will look at some ways that you may give now, and I'll wrap up with some things to consider as part of your estate plan. So Rick, I'm turning it over to you to get started. Thanks, Cheryl. So today I'm gonna to go over plan giving and provide some insight on what that actually entails. You might've heard the term plan giving before, but what does that actually mean? Plan giving is the gifting of your assets to fulfill your charitable goals. Often plan gifting is written into your estate plan, but it can occur during your lifetime or at death. If we could jump to the next slide. And most of the time people utilize plan giving to leave behind a legacy and their hope is to pay it forward, so to speak, for future generations. Now, we're gonna have a polling question here. There are a lot of different ways to donate to charity. Of the following options, which do you think is the most widely used method? Online, cash, bank or wire transfer, or PayPal? Give you a few seconds here. Okay, and let's see what the results were. Okay, most people said online, and you were correct. So if we can jump to the next slide. The most popular way to give is via online, via credit or debit card. Also, which probably comes as no surprise, social media has the largest impact on driving people to donate, which makes sense if you give it some thought. The days of paper mail are far behind us, and organizations are, they've caught on to that. Next time you're on Twitter, or Facebook, or even Instagram, do a quick search for your local, for some of your favorite local charitable organizations. Chances are you're going to find them. In fact, it's never been easier to donate, and you can actually usually do it right on the spot. Uh, you'll see campaigns like Giving Tuesday, and it'll provide a link that you can click on and, and donate instantly. The goal of these charities is to inspire you to set up recurring donations. But if that doesn't work, there's always good old fashioned guilt. I'm sure we've all seen the Sarah McLaughlin commercials for the SPCA. Every time I see those, I wanna dip into my savings account. In all seriousness though, you need to think about this. Just because an organization has good marketing, it doesn't mean they're putting your money to good use. Make sure you do some research and find out how your funds are being used. Next slide, please. Next, I'll talk a bit about the benefits of planned giving and the advantages of proactively thinking uh, how you want your family to inherit your assets. There are several economic benefits to planned giving, and one of the biggest draws for people is tax savings. Chances are, if you're listening to this webinar, you already have some experience with gifting. There may even be certain organizations you're passionate about and already are on a recurring gifting schedule. In many cases, there's already an opportunity for tax savings, but people just are not aware of it. Part of what we do as financial planners is help you be more efficient around your gifting to maximize that tax savings. We're gonna dive into some specifics of different gifting strategies later on. Next slide. There's a popular quote that states, when you've reached the top, send the elevator back down for the others. For a lot of people, they choose to give to charity because of how rewarding it is. And the tax savings is merely a perk. Giving to charity can be a meaningful way to make sure that you leave the world a better place than you found it. Next slide. There can also be benefits to your heirs from a family's charitable gifting plan. There are mentorship opportunities where the heirs can be mentored and then in turn mentor others. This gives your heirs an opportunity to continue a charitable mission that was started from your family. And finally, real world skills can also be developed. Things like teamwork, problem solving skills and strategic thinking are all skills that families can learn when forming a charitable gifting plan. 
These skills can help your heirs feel more confident and can help reduce the risk that their self-worth will be wrapped up in the family's inheritance or influence. After hearing all this, you may be thinking, where do you start? Let's go over some suggested strategies for those of you who want to incorporate charitable gifting into your life. There's an approach called the Leave 10 approach, and this is where you leave 90% of your assets to your heirs, but you make sure to carve out 10% towards charity. And these assets can range from anything from cash, investments, property, and even works of art. You can also do what we call adopting another child. A popular technique in this method is to fund local scholarships. And this could be done at your alma mater or maybe even a local high school. I have some friends who have done this and they personally love how hands-on the approach is. You can set the criteria for scholarships, you can interview candidates, and even follow people's collegiate careers. Another option is to simply ask your heirs if they are open to having you give away some of their inheritance now. That way you can see the positive impact it has while you're still around and it can be a bonding experience with your loved ones. If you're still unsure if these strategies will work for you or don't know which ones are the best fit, you may want to consider a comprehensive financial plan. A plan will allow you to see all of your financial goals and concerns reviewed in one analysis. West Financial offers financial planning as a standalone service, and we charge on an hourly basis, meaning we don't have to manage your assets to give you advice. And we're big proponents that anyone can benefit from a few hours of planning. Next, Kristen's gonna go over some um, charitable gifting more in detail. Thanks, Rick. Um, before we get to the next section, we have another poll question. And that question is, what influences you most when deciding to donate to a charity? Is it the desire to impact and help those in need? Is it a personal experience with an organization? Good marketing or celebrity endorsement? The size and reputation of the charity? Tax benefits or some other influence? I'll give you a second there. Okay, so it looks like a majority of people have a desire to have an impact and uh, help those in need, which is coincidentally um, one of the reasons why you may want to coordinate a charitable gift plan now. Being able to see your donations in action is um, a big benefit of putting something into place now versus waiting until um, you, you leave something after your death. The other top uh, benefit would be current year tax benefits, but even that is an area where you may need to do a little bit of planning. Now the standard deduction is a lot higher. Some other reasons, um, recognition from the charity, uh, although quite enough people make anonymous donations that that's you know sort of a personal preference. And then if you put into place a gifting strategy over time, it can help reduce your taxable estate with the caveat that you don't want to gift away too much now. You want to make sure you've planned your uh, future so that you don't run out of money yourself in retirement. Um, so those are some of the reasons why you would want to do this. We're going to talk a little bit about some specific strategies. And as Rick mentioned, social media has made it easier and easier to be able to do one-off gifts or even set up recurring gifts over time. I myself have an automatic contribution going to some animal welfare organizations. Um, so at any uh, income level or net worth, there's a strategy to put together a charitable plan. Some of the um, strategies we're gonna look at next uh, require certain types of assets or be of a certain age or just have a, a bigger intent than just one-off gifting. So this one we love, the charitable, um, the highly appreciated securities gift. Um, what we see in planning a lot is people coming in with these large, uh, stock positions or mutual fund positions. And these are something that they bought a long time ago and just watched it go up and up and up. 
or it's uh, some way that they got lucky. Either way, there's an emotional attachment to the winners. It's kind of like gambling. You don't want to quit while you're, while you're ahead. But um, this strategy addresses both the emotional impact and the, and the tax impact, because obviously, if you're going to sell a winner, you're going to pay some taxes on it. So in the example here, we're going to gift $29,000 to the Journalism Institute. And we want to do that by selling shares of a stock, in this case, Microsoft, that was purchased a long time ago in 2009 at a pretty low price. Um, if we were to sell that stock, then we're going to have to pay capital gains. And that capital gains hit looks to be about $6,400. And then we have a decision to make. Do we give the Journalism Institute the net from selling the stock and paying the taxes, or do we give them the full amount that we're gonna give them and pay the tax as a cost? Well, there's another option and that's the uh, gifting of the appreciated shares. In this case, you gift away the shares to the um, Journalism Institute, to the charity who then sells it without having to pay the taxes. So it eliminates the cost involved in, pay in selling the shares it gives the full amount to the charity, and um, you get to take a charitable deduction for the value of the stock at the time of the gift. So again, it's a really great strategy we like to use. It also helps with rebalancing portfolios um, around those really large positions that people are, if, you know, for the most part, unwilling to, to get rid of. The next strategy is even more uh, highly um, individualized in that uh, the qualified charitable distribution is somewhat of a misnomer as it's not really a distribution at all, but an income exclusion. And how this came about is um, people have, uh, you know, a lot of our clients have amassed really large retirement uh, account balances and IRAs and retirement plans. And when it comes to taking the required minimum distributions that we all have to take at age 72, sometimes that amount becomes just more income that you have to pay taxes on that you don't really need for your living expenses. So the qualified charitable distribution um, came into place a few years back. And what this allows you to do is to directly um, contribute part of that required minimum distribution to a charity. And what that does is it reduces your taxable income. You don't have to report that anymore. Um, some of the things to remember here is you have to be 70 and a half and older. Now there is sort of a, a hazy watercolor area between 70 and a half and 72 because the SECURE Act pushed back the required minimum distribution age to 72, but the qualified charitable distribution remains at 70 and a half. You can still do it. It just has a different impact with regard to taxes. Um, but if you are a 72, you can do this. There's a limit of $100,000 and that limit is applied to the minimum distributions that you have to take from IRAs only. So if you have a lot of wealth in qualified retirement plans, those aren't going to generate the distributions that you can take uh, a qualified charitable distribution from. So keep that in mind. And it has a, to be a direct transfer. So you're gonna wanna work with your IRA custodian to make sure that the transfer goes directly to the charity and that it is um, appropriately accounted for in terms of your uh, taxes. So what, the, what this does is immediate cash income to the charity and it lowers your adjusted gross income so that you might be eligible for different tax um, credits. It certainly could lower your income for Medicare premium calculations. Again, with every other um, strategy we talk about today, it has the potential to reduce your taxable estate and it's not an itemized deduction because it just it is an offset to an income item. So you don't get an itemized deduction, but you can keep uh, contributing to charities to have an itemized deduction and or use the higher standard deduction. So it works no matter what. The final strategy I'm going to talk about is the donor advised fund. And this is a favorite of mine because it's got a relatively low barrier to entry. Um, and think of it as an individual investment account strictly for uh, charitable gifting. Um, so you, what you do is you open a donor advised fund at a um, sponsoring organization. Fidelity 
Schwab and Vanguard or some of the bigger well-known organizations where you can open a donor advised fund. Then you fund it as you would any investment account with cash. You can use the publicly traded securities uh, like the highly appreciated securities we talked about earlier. This is a great place to put those as well. Um, restricted stock, you can put cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin in the fund. Um, any sort of asset that can go into an investment account most likely will go into a donor advised fund. And once it's funded, the investments you can buy and sell like any other investment account and it's all tax free. And that those monies are there to pay out to charities based on your request. Now, technically the sponsoring entity has the final say on how the donations are paid out, but for the most part, you can direct where the money goes. And then you have this sponsoring organization that helps with your record keeping associated with your gifting strategy. Now, the one thing to keep in mind here is that you get a, con you get a deduction when you make the contribution, not when the donations are paid out. So that's a little bit of a mind shift you have to have here. And one of the planning strategies we use for donor advised funds is to bunch uh, a number of years of charitable deductions into one year so that you can exceed that standard deduction and get an itemized deduction um, and you know you want to structure this in a year where itemizing has the be best benefit for you um, in terms of your taxes. And you definitely want to consider working with a tax professional or a financial advisor to structure this appropriately. And while there's a lot of flexibility with the donor advised fund, it is an irrevocable gift. You can't take money in and out other than to pay out um, to charities. Um, but it can be part of a legacy gifting plan for your family. Um, many organizations allow you to create a succession plan. You can uh, leave your donor advised funds to heirs or directly to charity, and you can even pass it to uh, the fund sponsor via your will. So again, low barriers to entry I've seen as low as $5,000 to open up uh, an account, and then you have a great um, all-in-one place to, to manage your charitable gifting strategy. So I'm going to pass it to Cheryl to wrap up and talking about legacy planning. Hey, Kristen. And I have our final polling question. Uh, this one is a little bit more personal, but remember it's anonymous, so no shaming here. Uh, but we would like to know, what is the state of your estate plan? Uh, my estate plan documents are all signed and current, or I had a will drafted years ago, but have not updated it since. Um, I've thought about it, but it's kind of depressing to talk about, so let's not talk about it. Or final choice, what is an estate plan? All right, so looks like very good. Um, Folks have um, had some estate plan put in place, but you know, maybe worth the review. Um, I will say, uh, while it seems a bit morbid, anyone in our industry uh, will tell you it is important to have a legacy plan. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, um, we'll just review uh, what a legacy plan does for you. Um, legacy actually refers to the mark individuals leave on the world hopefully lasting beyond their lives. So putting that plan in place provides peace of mind and knowing your wishes are well documented. It protects that plan from becoming misguided or possibly even derailed. And it ensures that those individuals and charities who matter most to you are provided for. So where do you start? First, to simply gather your data, document what you own to include values, titling, and location. And you may also want to consider your wishes and concerns and, and list those. There are many data gathering forms to help you do this. You can find one online, or if you would like a copy of the one we use here at West, I'm happy to share that form with you if you want to contact me after our presentation. Once you've compiled this information, consult with an estate planning attorney. It is important to choose an attorney who practices estate planning and is familiar with estate laws in your state. The attorney will discuss his or her process, review fees, and recommend what documents you need. If you agree and want to move forward, the attorney will prepare drafts of the needed documents. 
And when those drafts are complete, the attorney should provide copies for your review. Make sure that the information in your documents is accurate and that you understand the documents. If so, and you're comfortable, you can go ahead and sign the documents. But once they're signed, verify next steps with the attorney. Do any of your documents need to be filed? And if so, how and where? Um, where should you store your documents for safekeeping? And should any of your assets be retitled or should you change any current beneficiary designations? Don't make the mistake of thinking everything is finished once you've signed your documents. Unfortunately, I, I see this happen way too often. So on the next slide, <clears throat> We'll briefly review some of the estate planning documents attorneys typically recommend and what purpose they usually serve. A last will and testament, or a will for short, is a legal document directing the transfer of your assets at your passing. A will names an administrator who disposes of your property according to your directions in the will. And it will also name a guardian for any minor children. A durable power of attorney, or sometimes called POA for short, is also a legal document. However, this is a document that, unlike a will, that comes into play at your death. This is a legal document used during your lifetime, and it appoints a representative to make decisions for you if you become incapacitated. And there are two types you need here. The first one is a financial power of attorney for financial matters, such as with your bank accounts or investment accounts. And the second is a durable power of attorney for healthcare. Sometimes you'll also hear this referred to as a healthcare proxy, and that's for medical decisions on your behalf. A living will is simply a document that will state your desires pertaining to medical treatment, particularly around end of life treatments. And many times we'll see attorneys uh, recommend trust, particularly a um, living trust or an inter vivos trust. You'll also sometimes hear this referred to as a revocable trust. This type of trust is set up during your lifetime and assets that you own, such as your home or investments, can be retitled into the trust. You can appoint yourself or others to serve as trustee, but regardless, the trustee's job is to manage trust assets according to the terms of the trust thereby protecting those assets and providing continued management of those assets should something happen to you. Since you control and um, have use of the assets, any income earned by the trust is taxable to you. So on the next slide, we want to review um, how assets are transferred. It's important to know how, how your assets will be transferred. These are three of the most common transfer methods. So probate is the term used for the process of administering and distributing a deceased person's assets through his or her estate. And if you have that document we just spoke about, a will, the process is fairly straightforward. Your administrator follows your directions and everything should be fairly clean. But if you don't have a will, the process is a little bit more onerous. Without a will, when you pass, you are said to have died intestate and your state's probate court decides on beneficiaries of your state, um, guardian of any minor children. And this is according to your state's law, not necessarily your wishes. And I'll just comment, we've all heard um, probably some negative comments around probate. I, I will tell you that the probate process adds some time and cost to settling a state and navigating the details can be a bit cumbersome. It's not really difficult. It's just a bit of a pain. Um, so it's usually a good idea to have some funds go through probate to settle final expenses of your estate, but for larger valued assets, it may be worth considering some ways to avoid probate. Um, these can be assets in a trust, for example. Uh, the trust names beneficiaries and the trustee will distribute assets according to the trust terms. Um, that can be immediately or it can be over time or as needed. So a third way assets uh, transfer at your passing is by contract. You typically fill out a beneficiary form for assets such as retirement accounts, um, life insurance policies, and annuities. And these are simple forms to complete. Often um, you can find them on your provider's website. However, many people don't know that you can also name beneficiaries on assets such as bank accounts, brokerage accounts, and possibly even real estate. Uh, some states will even allow you to directly transfer your vehicle by having a transfer on death designation on, on the title. 
You'll often have to request these forms from the institution holding your account. But when you list a transfer or pay on death designation, these assets will also pass outside of that pain of probate. Uh, something else you should keep in mind is that beneficiary designations will typically override a will. Uh, so if your will names your children as beneficiaries of your life insurance, but the insurance company has your sister as beneficiary, your children are most likely not going to be paid. So looking at the next slide, we have uh, some strategies in testamentary gifting. Uh, so the first one, a gift by will, uh, sometimes it's called a bequest, and that's one of the most popular ways to leave assets. You can designate a certain asset, uh, a certain amount, or a certain percentage of your estate to be gifted per your will. Most estate planners will recommend the latter, gifting a percentage. If, you, if your will designates a certain asset, there's a risk that you won't own that asset at the time you pass. And if your will designates a certain amount, there's a risk that your asset levels could drop and that a particular amount cannot be distributed. Um, therefore, if you designate a certain percentage, that, that may be a better strategy. So the other strategy for testamentary gifting is by beneficiary designation. And there are several benefits to this strategy. You don't have to spend time or money uh, in changing your will. And as we've talked about, beneficiary designations uh, avoid that dreaded probate. And there are also certain assets that may be more efficient to leave to charity. Uh, Christy mentioned the 2019 SECURE Act earlier. Another change this act brought about is how retirement assets are passed to non-spousal beneficiaries. No longer are most beneficiaries able to stretch out the requirement of distribution um, over their lifetime. There are a few exceptions here, but for the most part, beneficiaries must now withdraw the entire account balance of any inherited IRA over a 10-year period following the IRA owner's passing. So this significantly accelerates the income tax due on retirement funds, and it makes them less tax efficient. So because of this change, many estate planners recommend that if you have both charitable and family need goals, you may want to consider leaving retirement accounts to charities. Uh, this is because those traditional IRAs and other retirement plans naming qualified charities uh, pay no federal gift tax, uh, no federal estate tax, and no state estate tax. Also, there is no uh, federal or state income taxes paid. So with all the taxes that these charities can avoid on retirement accounts, it, it does make a huge difference in what the charity can receive versus a non-spousal beneficiary. So in the last slide, we're wrapping up and we'll just briefly cover other strategies um, that are out there. Split interest gifts can present some intriguing and unique opportunities when it comes to balancing those charitable and family goals. And at a high level, the concept is fairly simple. Uh, you have an asset that you would ultimately like to leave to charity, but you want to retain some use of the asset for a period of time, possibly as, as long as the rest of your life. Split interest gifts allow you to do this while potentially providing some tax benefits. So you can think of it as having your cake and eating it too. Um, these strategies can be fairly complex. And you'll typically want to work with a seasoned team, um, usually your financial advisor, your attorney, and your CPA, just to make sure the strategy is properly structured and implemented. So that is the end of our presentation slide. Um, I'm looking to see if we have any questions. Let's see here. Cheryl, there is a question. Um, do you need a power of attorney if you're married or would like your or would your spouse automatically fill that role? Okay, great question. And the answer is yes, you do need a power of attorney even if you're married. Uh, spouses will not automatically fill that role. And there's another question. How much money do I need in order to start contributing to a donor advised fund? I um, mean, that really depends on what sponsoring organization you use. Um, I just looked up the three I mentioned. Uh, Fidelity doesn't have a minimum initial contribution amount, um, but obviously you're going to want to start with something so you can 
have some money to gift away. Both uh, Vanguard and Schwab have a $25,000 minimum, but uh, you can certainly look around and see if there are other um, sponsoring organizations that have lower minimums. I mean, Fidelity is pretty much the lowest though. Um, and then Rick, what is a good percentage of income to donate to charity each year? And is there a rule of thumb for charity? You know, honestly, there's no rule of thumb. You know, at the end of the day, you have to decide if charitable giving is something you want to pursue. And there's no right or wrong number. I would say, think about it logically and says, don't leave yourself strapped at the end of the month by giving away too much. Uh, try to find a happy middle ground. All right. Somebody's asking, can you explain the difference between revocable and irrevocable trusts? Yes. So, um, Basically, revocable trust, that living trust is a trust that it can be changed, it can be amended, you can even end it if you want. An irrevocable trust, when you set that up, that is a trust that typically cannot be changed. The benefit that an irrevocable trust gives you is that when you give to that, it does remove assets from your um, taxable estate. And so that can be a, a benefit to setting something up and gifting it irrevocably. But when you do that, you know there, there are no strings attached attached. You have no use of those assets typically, and you're, you're given that away. Um, is there a book you recommend on this subject? Um, that is a good question, and I don't have any suggestions. I could follow up with you. Um, I know there are a few out there. Um, I'm not recalling the titles right now. Kristen or Rick, I don't know if you have any suggestions. No, I think uh, we would have to look into a good book to recommend. Um, you know, I don't want to off the cuff it without <laughs> doing some research. We can definitely research that and follow up. But that's a great question. All right. A current minimum amount for federal estate taxes to be charged. And that amount is eleven million dollars. Kristen, refresh my memory. Eleven. Eleven seven. Eleven seven. Yes. Um, so that's where it is currently. Um, that could change, um, but right now, per individual, it's eleven million seven hundred thousand. Yeah, and that's due to sunset at the end of 2025. So when that sunsets, it'll go down to approximately six million. What about for households? Um, so you just add the two together. So right. 11, 7, 11, 7 is. Yeah. 33, 4? Right. So pretty, pretty high amount. Um, but yeah, uh, between spouses, you can combine that. Please go over the process of how someone would use your firm's service for second, third steps. Okay. Um, so if you want, as Rick said, we do offer standalone financial planning. Um, so if you're looking at goals, whether it's charitable planning, retirement planning, um, education planning, or a combination of all those, uh, we do charge uh, per hour for our financial planning services. You don't have to use our asset management services in order to um, take advantage of that. Uh, but we also offer asset management. So many times after financial planning, Clients do decide to become asset management clients, um, uh, understanding our process and, and how we work. Um, but I think a lot of times uh, clients do start with us, which is that financial planning process. Yeah, Rick, do you want to go over how we uh, do a plan, like real briefly? Yeah, so typically, you know, we would have a meeting. So I want to reach out, just find out what your goals are, and then we'll quote you on how long you know we think that's going to take us to complete and it may be certain subject it may go over retirement cash flow projections maybe estate planning insurance planning really we can take a look at whatever you want as the more details you can provide the the better and at the end of the process we'll sit down we'll go through the write-up answer any questions you have and um, you know we're like as i said in the presentation we're big proponents that anyone could benefit from a few hours of planning try to look at it as a roadmap right it's going to get you to where you want to be and it also gives you some projections that you can use as a benchmark, say even 10 years down the road to see if you're tracking along with them. 
What's the per hour rate? Uh, typically it's 200, 250 an hour. But we do, um, we kind of uh, present an engagement as a, a, um, a project base. So we'll figure out how many hours and then we'll quote like the full amount in a range. And we usually try to go at the middle of the range and it'll never go beyond the high end of the range. So you know upfront what you're gonna pay pretty much. Uh, when should I start financial planning? I don't have any assets, but I hope to grow them. Well, as Rick said, anybody can um, start planning whenever. Uh, it's always good to get started early so that you can build that foundation. And when you when you come back, usually we think uh, people should come in like 10 years before they're ready to retire. So there's plenty of time to make adjustments if they don't have the assets they need to retire and, and live comfortably for the rest of their life on. But you know, if you get started early knowing how to budget, how to save, where to invest, how to manage your your benefits and all that other stuff then that's great you may as rick said only need a few hours and we can accommodate that and we also have like a um a retainer program that's pretty inexpensive that follows you throughout the year with some of the financial decisions that you have to make and we're basically on call to, to help you through those questions and the question, how do you handle asset management? Is it a percentage of assets? So the answer to that is yes. Um, our fees are generally about 1% uh, for the asset management. Um, that's an annual charge and we do bill quarterly on that. Okay. I am not seeing any more questions. Thank you. Those are some good questions. We appreciate your questions. Um, we also appreciate your time um, and appreciate the Journalism Institute for allowing us to, to speak to you today. Um, and, oh, another question to come in, how is the retainer plan charged? So I think that is a financial planning question. So Rick or Kristen? Yeah, so it's based on it, it's a quarterly basis. So it's a quarterly retainer. And so it, it is a bit it, our hourly rates 200 250 an hour. Some people want say eight hours a quarter, other people only want four. It, it's really tailored to each individual person. Okay. And I am not seeing any other questions. So again, we thank you for your time. We thank the Journalism Institute for allowing us to speak today. If you do think of another question after this presentation or you didn't get a chance to ask your question, um, you will, uh, I think there's gonna be a follow-up email. You will have our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to speak individually um, and answer any questions or concerns you may have. Um, but again, thank you. And Beth, I will turn it back to you. Thank you so, so much, Cheryl, Kristen, and Rick. We're really grateful for your ex expertise and your time today exploring these areas with our participants. I know I've learned a lot and uh, we'll be reaching out soon with more questions. Um, on behalf of the Institute, I wanna thank everybody who joined us today for this conversation and learning. Part of my work with the Institute is to help connect potential donors with opportunities to see their funds put to work through the Institute. As the Institute's contact for giving, I hope that you and I can stay in touch on your charitable giving goals and how we can re help you reach them. You're going to receive an email, as Cheryl said, from the Institute with my contact information and the contact information for Kristen, Rick, and Cheryl. Um, I do look forward to uh, talking with each of you soon. So thank you all, have a wonderful day and um, have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you. Bye.